Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Today, we're going to be talking about a topic that affects all 8 billion people on the planet, and that is human rights. My guest today is an expert on this topic, Mr. Greg Mulkaver, a lawyer and specialist in international human rights law, policy, and methodology, is the director of the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights in New York. Craig, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thanks, Bill. Great to be with you again. I appreciate it. It's only been 20 short years ago. We, we'll, we'll do it again, right? <laughs> well, good. Well, let's just start off with a basic question. What is the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights Office? What's its main function? When was it formed? Why was it formed? Well, of course, there's well, always there's the Human Rights Office, Office at the United Nations well, since the founding since of the organization in 1945. Uh, and in the early days, the Human Rights Office was very much focused on just developing the norms and standards of human rights, most notably the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. But in 1993, we had a, a real expansion of that office with the establishment of the post of a High Commissioner for Human Rights. Of course, there's always been a uh, United Nations Human Rights Office going all the way back to the beginning of the organization in 1945. After all, human rights is one of the three principal purposes of the organization. So you needed a, a part of the office of the organization responsible for that. Um, but in 1993, we had a great expansion of the mandate and the authority and the resources of that office when the member states of the organization agreed to establish a high commissioner for human rights at the helm of the human rights office. And that was a very interesting development. There have been proposals for it going back many decades. But when it was established, it gave a direct mandate to the office to deal with human rights in all countries and all issues everywhere, and to report directly to the member states on the work that we're doing. And over time, that office has built up its capacities in human rights monitoring, human rights investigations, standard setting, technical cooperation, uh, a whole range of uh, specialized human rights functions, um, all dedicated to the human rights purposes that are in the UN Charter uh, itself. And now we are present in over 100 countries around the world. We have a big office here at New York, uh, in New York at UN headquarters, trying to integrate human rights into the work of the Security Council, the General Assembly, the UN agencies. And of course, our headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland, where hundreds of human rights specialists are working every day on all of the issues uh, that are concerning the international community in this field. And if our viewers would like more information, they can go to www.ohchr.org to get much more information than what we're going to be able to provide today. Well, you're absolutely right. Uh, as I recall, the Charter of the United Nations, when it was, I wasn't there, <laughs> you weren't there, but anyway, we know, we've read about it. And it was, uh, the UN was formed in 1945 in San Francisco, California. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights has been the linchpin, seems to me, of the, the whole discussion about human rights. And that came online, what, December 10th, 1948. What exactly is the Universal Declaration for Human Rights? Well, the declaration is, as its name suggests, a universal uh, document that lays out what we mean when we say human rights. The Charter committed the organization to the protection of human rights, but it didn't define what those human rights were. In the Universal Declaration, you had the first time this kind of vision for a new international order in which all states would be accountable for the promotion and protection of human rights as an international matter, not uh, no longer as a matter for the internal sovereignty of a state, but something that was a legitimate concern of the whole international community. And the beauty of the Universal Declaration, which is now this year we're celebrating its 75th anniversary with uh, Human Rights 75, the beauty of it was that it included all the civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights together with a, a kind of equal status. And it said that the role of the state effectively is ensuring freedom from fear and freedom from want for all people without discrimination. And that is the central cornerstone of the UN's human rights mission. It's the marching orders of the, of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, the office for which I work. How do you define human rights today as opposed to 1948 when the Universal Declaration for Human Rights came online? It's an interesting question, you know, because uh, today we have inherited in this century all of the human rights challenges of the last one. Racism and colonialism and genocide and apartheid and torture 
None of these things have gone away, and we are responsible for trying to work to eradicate these scourges from the earth. But at the same time, in our current age, we have layered on top of those human rights challenges a whole host of new challenges that flow from things like population aging, massive inequalities, uh, technological developments like mass surveillance, and artificial uh, intelligence, uh, a whole range of questions, uh, climate change, for example, which has reached a peak and is now threatening the full range of human rights that were codified in the Universal Declaration. But the norms and standards themselves have not changed. They have only become more defined. So that, that first articulation in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is as I, I explained it to you, that needed to be then codified further in binding treaties with much more specific language on what the obligations were for protecting and promoting those human rights. And so since the adop adoption of the Universal Declaration, we've seen the development of all of these human rights treaties, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the International Covenant on Economic and Social Rights, dedicated treaties on the rights of women, of migrants, of minorities, uh, on genocide, and a whole host of, of other issues and groups that have made those obligations much more specific, and those in turn have led to the establishment of international mechanisms to monitor the degree to which those rights are being either implemented or, unfortunately, very often violated by states all around the world. So we know what the rules are. We've got mechanisms in place to monitor how they're being respected or not. We've got programs in place to help governments and people in civil society to try to realize those uh, those rights, but the challenges, uh, I, I dare say, uh, are much more numerous than they have ever been. And so many of those human rights specialists have lauded the importance of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and how it is a remarkable document to have been drafted so many years ago, 75 years ago, something like that. And of course, we read the history books and we see Eleanor Roosevelt played a key role in that. It was a lot of, there were a lot of inputs into that the uh, French, the rights of man concept, the U.S. Constitution, Franklin Roosevelt's four freedoms, and so many ideas that came together, but it's really a remarkable document. It certainly is. Now, the Office for the High Commission for Human Rights and the High Commissioner, how does, well, let's, let's back up a little bit. The Human Rights Council, what is the Human Rights Council and how do you interact with the Human Rights Council? You know, the Human Rights Council is the main political body of the United Nations. It's a body of member states uh, that is responsible for uh, for the field of human rights. This one of the three principal purposes of, of the United Nations. It convenes in Geneva. Uh, it is um, uh, it, it meets almost continuously in the sense that it has several sessions a year, but in between sessions, it has a number of working groups and other mechanisms that are functioning. It deals with all civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights. We function independently of the council because the council is, as I said, a political body, whereas we are an expert body that functions as a part of the secretariat of the United Nations, but with a modicum of independence that comes from the high commissioner's mandate um, as, uh, as well. We advise the Human Rights Council, we support the Human Rights Council, we report to the Human Rights Council, but we are not a part of the Human Rights Council. The Human Rights Council is a body of member states. And of course, international human rights law is about holding states yes. accountable for their human rights conduct. So there are 193 states in the United Nations now. The hard reality is that every one of them has human rights problems. Every one of them has violated um, uh, human rights. So it's not a, a, an organization, the, the council is not an organization made up of uh, eminent human rights, uh, you know, states, because there aren't in, in the end. It is a peer body, a body of peers that work to first give authority in an intergovernmental system to the human rights work, and on the other hand, to hold each other accountable. For example, one of the most interesting developments in recent years in the Human Rights Council is the establishment of the Universal Periodic Review which was a response to concerns that sometimes the council, because it's political, could be unbalanced in its critique of one state or another. The Universal Periodic Review, which has now been seven, several cycles into its existence, is a mechanism where every single state, 193 of them, has their human rights record publicly reviewed 
uh, based upon a series of reports, a report from the government, but also reports from civil society and UN agencies, um, and then has to hear critique and commentary and recommendations on how to fix those human rights problems. And nobody is off the hook. That's every member state that's accountable to participate in that. So it plays a very valuable role. And of course, in the international legal system, it's the member states that create international law. And so many of the standards for human rights are set there in that mechanism. We're looking now at, for example, discussions around new human rights treaties that need to be developed. There are still some gaps. Think, for example, about the human rights of older persons in an aging global population where there is no treaty to protect their human rights and where we know as a matter of data that you know, the, the, the experience of aging for many people around the world is increasingly one of marginalization, exclusion, exclusion, neglect, abuse. You need an international instrument. It's only the member states in the international system that could adopt something like that. When I think of human rights, I think of I think that's one of the trickiest issues that the United Nations has to deal with. When it comes to eliminating the scourge of war, you can pretty much define what's going on and have 12 peacekeeping missions trying to bring peace to a very volatile, 12 very volatile areas of the world, or if you're promoting economic and social development. But when it comes to human rights, as somebody, I'm not sure if it's Yasser Arafat, somebody said years ago, one person's freedom fighter is another person's terrorist. And that seems to me that it's such a difficult transition. It depends upon which side you're on and how you view a particular situation. But it's it's really remarkable. The, the human rights folks do as good of a job. How do you balance that? Let, let me just ask you. Well, you know, we, we have a touchstone and the touchstone is international law and international standards. Uh, it's certainly true that as a matter of political rhetoric, one person's freedom fighter is another person's terrorist and vice versa. But it's not that we're operating in what would be a normative vacuum. One of the great legacies of the United Nations is the development of this body of international human rights law. We work based upon international standards for human rights, for humanitarian law, for international criminal law, for international refugee law. And those standards are quite precise. And we know that they apply in all situations, including situations of armed conflict. You know, the idea that civilians are uh, uh, are uh, not fair game in situations of, uh, of, of conflict. This is a universal rule uh, in, in all situations. So we don't make judgments about the legitimacy of, of conflicts in the human rights side of the house. That's the business of the, the Security Council that judge acts of aggression and uh, foreign occupation and so on. Our business is how human rights are respected in all situations. And there are particular vulnerabilities in conflict situations, but there are rules to protect civilians, to protect people who are not participating in conflict and so on. And those have been very well codified in international humanitarian law, international human rights law, international criminal law, international refugee law as well. Uh, so uh, it's not a matter of opinion. Uh, and I think this is, this is really important because, you know, human rights is something which, uh, you know, states in order to defend themselves against human rights critique will use political arguments quite often. Uh, and the, the dialogue can quickly get politicized. If we were not in a situation where the law was so specifically codified, where the rules of the game were defined universally, then we would be open to that criticism all the time. Of course, we get that criticism nevertheless. No country likes to be criticized for its human rights abuses, especially those who are guilty of gross and systematic uh, abuses of, uh, of human rights. But we simply refer back to the norms and standards that are the cornerstone of our mandate, and it's very, very difficult to argue against those. It certainly is. There's no doubt about it. It's very, very difficult. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We'd invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with the PBS, or community access television station, or you have an educational institution that has an intra campus television hookup, or you just have a podcast, or you just have a computer, you like our shows and you'd like to share them, please feel free to do so. Global Connections Television is provided at no cost as a public service to help us better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today, we're taking a look at an international issue that affects everyone and that is their human rights. My guest today is an expert on this topic. 
Mr. Craig Mulkeber, a lawyer and specialist in international human rights, law, policy, and methodology, is the director of the Office of the United Nations High Commission for Human Rights in New York. Craig, we're, we have so many areas, so many ways we could go when we're talking about human rights, but one you brought up a minute ago, we we're talking about the Human Rights Council, and I don't want to get too far into it, but the way the United Nations operates is, and a lot of people I think are confused about this, but when people come on to the Human Rights Council, or countries, or states come on to the Human Rights Council, they're not selected by Antonio Guterres or by you or the High Commissioner for Human Rights. They're selected through a regional arrangement and a regional vote, are they not? And we might spend a minute on that just to help clarify that, because the UN gets a lot of, I think, uh, bad publicity, undeserved, because it's like they're going out here and picking, you know, North Korea to put them on the World Health Organization's uh, board of directors or something like that. But you could spend a minute on that. Yeah, I think I think that's right. It's a very important point because you know the United Nations is in the first instance an intergovernmental organization. It is made up of the states of the world, and as I said earlier in our discussion, Bill, unfortunately there are no states that don't have human rights problems, um, uh, and and that means that there's nobody with clean hands. I and mean, you could say the same thing of the Security Council, which has a number of members, uh, including permanent members, who have committed acts of aggression and in direct violation of. Uh, uh, the norms of the war. So um, so to look for a kind of a clean intergovernmental body, I think misses the point. The point is to try to create mechanisms in the interstate system where states can be held uh, accountable uh, uh, under, under a single standard. And I think the Human Rights Council helps to serve that goal. Now you're never going to have a Human Rights Council made up of clean states because who would those states be? Uh, you know, even the 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 uh, most established democracies of the West have very serious human rights problems in terms of the treatment of minorities, the treatment of migrants, prison abuses, over incarceration, a whole range of issues that are quite profound in uh, in, in human rights terms. Um, what and 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 it's not that the human rights system of the UN is not built only on the intergovernmental structure of the Human Rights Council. Luckily. That piece of it, which is unavoidable in the interstate system, is complemented also by expert bodies like the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and by independent expert mechanisms like the UN Treaty Bodies on Human Rights, the Special Rapporteurs on Human Rights, the Working Groups. These are expert bodies independent of any government made up of the foremost experts in the world on the subject matter uh, at hand, and they are very much the jewel in the crown of the UN human rights system because they are not politicized. They have clean human rights records uh, and they are the ones who are bringing expertise and an unbiased non-political approach into the work of human rights. And together, all these pieces of the puzzle uh, help to create uh, a system where there's a hope that you can have some degree of accountability of perpetrators, redress for victims, empowerment of the vulnerable, uh, um, protection of rights holders, and even the building of capacities for states so they are able to meet their human rights obligations, all pieces of the UN human rights system. And it's so important to have all of the 193 member states, uh, basically most of the countries of the world, involved in the system. Because if you have a country isolated, they're certainly not going to improve on their own, I would imagine. But you're absolutely right. There's no perfect country. And there's some, uh, they always in the top groups that I've seen anyway, you always get Norway, Sweden, uh, the Netherlands, uh, groups like that. And then things deteriorate as they go a little deeper into the list. But before we run out of time, Craig, it's been a fascinating conversation. But let me ask you, what are the three major, you, you've already mentioned some of the uh, redefinitions of human rights and some of the new issues, new topics, uh, new groups being focused on. But what are the three major human rights, uh, I, I guess, um, really difficult, the most difficult human rights issues to deal with today? Well, I'll tell you, Bill, the, the, one of them that I would mention, which would, would have been on the list in the past, is the idea of human rights itself, which has been very much under threat recently in countries around the world. You know, this idea that um, security should be defined as human security, that we should all be uh, have freedom from fear and freedom from want, that we should be free of the fear that, yes, 
you know, somebody will hijack an airplane and crash it into a building and kill us in an act of terrorism. But we also should be free of the fear that our own government will, you know, uh, arrest us in the middle of the night, take us off to a dungeon, put us in an orange, orange jumpsuit because it doesn't like our race or religion or political opinion or our critique um, of, of that government. And that the kinds of actions that states have taken in the name of security, like uh, arbitrary arrest and detention and torture and uh, all of these sorts of things, these are not acts of security, these are assaults on security. And this is really very much what civil and political rights in the human rights system tell us. At the same time, the idea that health and education and housing and uh, social security and decent work, that these are not commodities that are for sale to those who can afford them or privileges that you have to be born into. But according to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, these are fundamental human rights to which all people are entitled without discrimination. Or the idea that uh, we, we reject the notion of the other, that defining someone as being the other and then uh, uh, perpetrating all sorts of abuses against them based upon their race or religion or gender or uh, ethnicity or sexual orientation, that, that any of that is, uh, is fair game. This very fundamental idea is now very much under assault, Bill, like we haven't seen it. I'm now 32 years at the United Nations Human Rights Program, uh, and I've never seen a moment in history when this very idea was so much under assault, the idea that all people are born free and equal in dignity and rights. And the fact that so many alternative visions, far-right visions, uh, uh, visions of, um, uh, of extremist ideologies are now gaining more and more ground in countries around the world is a real threat to this 75-year-old mission of, uh, of human rights. At the same time, the second thing I would say beyond the very idea of human rights is all of the old challenges of the last century that uh, I listed. I don't want to ever suggest that we have won the battle against racism, against um, poverty, against discrimination, against a genocide or apartheid or colonialism, all of those things continue to curse the world and in violation of international human rights standards. And we need to keep pushing against those. And then that third cluster that I mentioned of the new and emerging challenges that come from new technologies, that come from new demographic um, uh, realities, uh, all of those things add a, a, an additional um, layer as well. There's a lot of interesting work being done, Bill, to look at things, for example, like the human rights of future generations. This is not well codified, but many of the things that we do today will determine whether or not future generations enjoy even the degree of human rights that you and I have been able, have been able to enjoy in this world. The most obvious case, of course, climate change, which has the effect of undercutting all civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights. Even the, the right to self-determination, imagine, you're living on a small island, developing state, and your country disappears under the ocean. Where is your self-determination? Already, countless lives have been lost because of climate change, which we know from the United Nations research on the subject is the direct result of human action and a failure to mitigate that action in any meaningful way. If we don't answer those challenges, if we don't answer the challenges um, of, of the threats of new technologies as well, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights will not survive into the next century. They certainly won't. And that was a perfect way to wrap it up, Craig. It certainly was right on target. And we're seeing it now in the United States with the attack on democratic institutions, with attack on people who are Social Security recipients and that type of thing. But we're seeing it here and in other countries around the world. And it's extremely dangerous. And if we all don't have human rights, Nobody has human rights, so, as I see. It's a very simplistic way of looking at it. But Craig Mulkiever, I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. Always nice to be with you, Bill. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. My pleasure. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.